So welcome everyone to this uh, Diaz talk. My name is Martin Svensson. I am the chairman of the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science, uh, which for those who do not know it is just in the vicinity upstairs and of course the corridor upstairs here. So. <clears throat> And uh, I'm here today to introduce the speaker, Professor of Computer Science, Peter Schneiderkamp. So, um, Peter was hired at the uh, IMAD, as we call it, the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science in Danish speech, in uh, 2009, I believe. And um, since then, he's been, uh, he's been uh, around the university in many shapes and forms. Uh, some of you uh, uh, may have encountered him in his recent role as the PI for the Codex project. Um, <clears throat> so, Peter's research belongs to a realm of computer science called automated reasoning. And I asked Peter to provide me a one-liner for what he's interested in. And he said, supporting the development of reliable data-driven ICT systems through automated software tools based on strong mathematical principles. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> so applications of automated reasoning are, for example, software verification, hardware software synthesis, and computer assistive proofs. So um, today Peter will give an ID talk with a title that is particularly relevant for me, seeing as I am myself a mathematician. Artificial intelligence can computers replace mathematicians. Please go ahead, Peter. Thanks for the introduction, Martin. Uh, I think this is a good place to say that the Department of Mathematics, it, when it integrated computer science, uh, had some considerations to rename itself to the Department of Natural and Artificial Intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be on the artificial intelligence side, but we're going to take a look at the natural intelligence uh, side uh, too. And yeah, the title's of course a little bit provocative. Uh, can computer replace mathematicians? And the good news is, before we start the talk, not anytime soon, yeah. but, and there's a big but here. Uh, let's first uh, talk about how computers are not going to replace uh, mathematicians. Yeah. They're not going to uh, come in the form of uh, robots uh, holding chalk and uh, drawing formulas on blackboard uh, to prove uh, new theorems. That's my prediction. Let's uh, see if I will prove me wrong. Yeah. Uh, so this is a, a very beautiful picture, but uh, not exactly what we're going to look at today. Now, this is a lunch talk, and I hope you all got some food, or you still have some food. Yeah. So it will be served in four courses, the talk, not the food. Yeah. That's a circle cell. The first one being the smoking gun. It's uh, coloring the Pythagorean triples. Uh, it's uh, computer assisted proof, I can already tell you so much. And then I'll look a little bit more into what a proof is and uh, how the computer can assist with that and uh, what well, the challenges that we see there. And uh, in the third course, the main dish will come towards uh, the solution. And uh, I'll wrap up by taking a broader outlook on what is happening outside of uh, mathematical proofs in artificial intelligence and uh, how, this, uh, how what we learn from uh, teaching computers to do mathematics uh, can uh, help us uh, with the challenges that we will encounter during the next 30, 40 years with, uh, with artificial intelligence before it comes becomes intelligent enough that it will take care of the challenges itself, maybe. Now, let's start with the smoking gun, the coloring of the Pythagorean triples. Uh, this is also uh, has gotten uh, to be known as the 200 terabyte mathematical proof, the biggest uh, proof by size uh, of uh, all times. And uh, Marijn uh, Höhle uh, from the University of Texas, originally, he's Dutch, and I probably mispronounced his name. Uh, he, together with his colleagues, uh, got a supercomputer to produce this 200 terabyte proof uh, for a simple conjecture, to look at what the conjecture is. But uh, this draws a lot of attention because it's so large that uh, we, we don't need to guess anymore uh, can humans verify this proof or not. Now, uh, what is a Pythagorean triple? Well, a Pythagorean triple is a triple of three numbers, A, B, and C, such that A squared plus B squared is C squared. Here's a geometric interpretation where we can see that you know C squared here is the same as A squared and B squared, because this is, well, these uh, triangles here 
they uh, are identical, these are identical, and these two and well, the blue ones also. <coughs> they're blue. And uh, now the task here in uh, uh, this mathematical proof uh, is uh, to find out given uh, the tri triples until a certain number, can we color them by two colors? Let's call them blue and red. It could be black and white, whatever you like. Yeah, but uh, blue and red such that no uh, triangle is monochromatic, meaning that no triangle has only blue uh, corners or only red corners. And uh, well, for the first uh, uh, triples, the ones until 20, we have these six here. Yeah, and uh, well, as you can see, there are some interdependencies. If you color this one here red in this triangle, well, then it's also red for this triangle. And uh, these interdependencies are what makes uh, things a little bit complicated. There is, of course, a solution uh, for this. This is one of the possible solutions. And you can see this one here has a blue and a red. This has a blue and a red. This has a red and a blue. This one has a blue and a red. And uh, this one also has a blue and a red. And this one also has a blue and a red. Great. They are all not monochromatic. So we found the coloring uh, of uh, these triples. Now, uh, the things uh, blow up a little bit uh, when we come to all the triples until 7,284. Now, uh, this is a very good example of a computer-assisted proof, uh, which uh, is very easy to verify, yeah. uh, also by humans. Yeah. We have the numbers from uh, 1 to 7,284, and the ones that are part of some uh, triple, after some uh, symmetry uh, reductions, uh, um, they are either blue or red. And now we can go, we can just list all these triples. Yeah. It's many, but it's, uh, it's doable. A mathematician could do this in less than a year. Yeah. Go through all the triples and uh, check that by this coloring they are actually monochromatic. Yeah. So uh, where's the problem? The problem is when we do the plus plus, when we go from 7,284 to 7,285. Yeah. Because then there's no coloring. Well, that was at least the conjecture long time. No one has been able to uh, prove that conclusively. Uh, but uh, in 2016, they uh, managed uh, to produce a uh, proof for this. And uh, this uh, conclusively, well, the claim has proven that uh, there is uh, no uh, such coloring for the uh, triples until 7,285, including. Now, uh, a 200 terabyte proof uh, corresponds to 157 million and a few Bibles, yeah? standard Bibles. They are 13 by 3 by 18 by 4 centimeters uh, and uh, 4 centimeters thick. And if you lie them down flat and one after the other, this is a circle that goes uh, through Toulouse, Sochi, where the Olympic Games were, and uh, Toronto. Well, that would probably be the other way around. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so this is a circle of uh, 28,974 uh, kilometers. Yeah. Just uh, to have an idea that each of them has 896 pages. Yeah. And it's very thin paper. Yeah. So this is really a lot of information. Now, uh, one mathematician who would be really well trained could uh, process this at a speed that would take 10 billion years to verify this proof. Luckily, we have a better option. We can train 100 million uh, people to be mathematicians. This is consistent with some expectation about mathematical talent uh, in the general population, yeah. assuming that we will reach uh, 10 billion uh, on the planet. Yeah. So this is... Uh, something uh, like a 1% uh, of the population has a mathematical talent uh, sufficient for this. Great. Then it will only take 100 years to verify this proof. You can scale it a little bit, yeah, but not much. So this is really infeasible. So uh, this is a good question to, or a good time to go back and uh, ask ourselves, computer-assisted proofs, uh, what does that actually mean? And what are the implications uh, here in uh, general? Well. I'm sure <coughs> there are some mathematicians here. Who's a mathematician <coughs> by training? Yes, well, there's a handful. Yeah. The rest aren't. Great. So let's uh, start with uh, defining what the proof is. Well, there are, there are many ways of doing that, and uh, I could probably talk two hours uh, about uh, uh, this uh, kind of question. But uh, we'll say that proofs are witnesses for the truth of statements. So you have a statement which says, for example, you can there's no coloring for the Pythagorean triples uh, uh, until 17,285. Yeah? And uh, then this can be either true or false. And uh, a proof 
would be something that uh, describes uh, conclusively uh, why this is the case. Proofs are, mathematical proofs are based on logics, yeah, and uh, they are often anyway given in natural language. <coughs> we will see that you can also give them in a formal language, but most mathematicians uh, uh, don't go to that uh, level. They also work a lot with their intuition and experience. Now, a proof is valid if uh, the only assumptions that you made are axioms. That, are, that means uh, you really have some very basic as assumptions that uh, are widely agreed upon. And uh, that uh, all the other statements that you just use without proving them, that they have been proven previously by other mathematicians or however. Yeah? And that all the steps in your proof are what you sound. That means uh, when you say, oh, this is true and this is true, and now I also know that this is true. Yeah? Well, then this has to follow from some kind of uh, logic uh, inference. It can be induction, deduction. Yeah? Now, there are many ways of uh, making proofs. Direct proofs, they just go and step by step prove what you want to prove. Uh, you can uh, make probabilistic proofs where you have an argument, not that it is probably true, uh, the statement, but an argument that uh, shows that the statement is true uh, using probabilistic means. Very interesting. You can use contraposition where you say, well, instead of uh, showing that uh, when we have A, we also have B, we show that when we don't have B, we don't have A. Yeah? This is uh, also very popular. Induction, where you show that uh, something holds for some elements, and then you have shown that when it holds for some elements, it will also hold for all the elements of something. And then finally, well, it's a long list more, but for us interesting, uh, by exhaustion, that is when you have a number of different cases to consider, and you will just exhaust all of them. You will look at all the cases. So you'll say, for example, either this number is negative, or it is positive, or it is zero. And then you have three cases, and you exhaust all the possibilities. And as you can imagine, you can combine these uh, strategies, and there are many more uh, here. Now, uh, sorry, can I ask the yes, question? of course. Yeah. You're all very so, uh, you know, Fermat last year. No? Sorry, if I, if I consider the Fermat last year, like yes. Fermat. Yeah. So it was attempted to do it be done with computers. Yes. And, but was never been able to prove whether it was actually true or not. So, and then the formal proof with that computers opened up an immense amount of mathematics. <coughs> I'm challenging it, eh? So, what would you consider the proof, better proof? The one that's been done that opens up an immense other possibilities or a proof by exhaustion? The question is do these need uh, to uh, exclude each other? But no, no, ex no, no. exhaustion is, of course, uh, not feasible in, in case you have an infinite number of cases, <coughs> like in this case. But, of course, uh, Andrew Wilde's uh, proof uh, and uh, all the work that he built on uh, that gave an immense boost to a lot so of areas of mathematics. Would you agree, yeah, would you agree that it's actually? It's good to have actually a hint from a computer. This but is it's so much better to have actually a full, uh, you know, uh, full proof, proof without the computer. We, we'll come back to that uh, in a moment, so I don't want to take too many proofs uh, ahead. But yes, <laughs> one of the first uh, proofs uh, that was uh, uh, done with computers, and uh, the one that uh, has widely become uh, known as the first uh, computer-assisted proof, although there were some other small uh, things that were proven with computers uh, before. That is uh, the four gamma <coughs> theorem. And this is saying that any map, so any planar uh, surface divided into uh, uh, some kind of other surfaces can be colored uh, by four colors in such a way that two neighboring surfaces don't uh, have the same color. And uh, this was uh, first uh, conjectured by a guy called Francis uh, Guthrie, or I have no idea how to pronounce it, his name. And uh, it was uh, finally proved in 1977 uh, by uh, Apple and Harkin. And uh, the fun part here is that a lot of people have tried in between, yeah, in the, uh, the years following uh, the original conjecture, there have been several proofs. And uh, two of the proofs that were not immediately debunked, they uh, actually, each of them survived for 11 years before someone found a mistake in them. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, how did Apple and Harkin finally do this? Well, they first uh, made a reduction to a finite number of cases. And this is based on deep mathematical insights uh, and uh, uh, this has been done uh, by hand, yeah? basically arguing that uh, any smallest counterexample to this, so any map that needs five colors, yeah? uh, you can always make a smaller map until it can get small and it's not any more counterexample. And if you consider only those, <laughs> then uh, they have to contain one of these cases. And uh, 
there were 1,936 of these uh, cases. So what they did is they programmed the computer to, with these cases to go through all of them and uh, color uh, these uh, maps. And uh, the result of, uh, is a 400 pages of microfilm uh, uh, that uh, are at least uh, hard uh, to verify uh, humanly. And uh, the biggest question, of course, that everyone started asking is, can we trust the computer program? Well, at that time, they also asked, can we trust the hardware? Uh, this is still an issue of hardware, but less uh, than it was uh, back then. Yeah. Now, uh, this, uh, some of the questions that uh, come with this, they are whether mathematics is actually an empirical science uh, or uh, not. Yeah. I mean, uh, the statements, they are only true mathematical statements that we want to prove if they hold for all cases. Yeah. So empirical confirmation that we tried for a lot of cases and uh, it always worked, yeah. this is not enough to <coughs> Proof that the statement is true. Now there are different views uh, on uh, uh, what mathematical truths are. The Platonist view is arguing that truth is something that exists. Uh, mathematics is abstract and exists uh, without any preconditions. And uh, all uh, true statements, they already exist. They just need to be discovered. Yeah? So this is uh, putting mathematics on the same level as uh, astronomy. Let's look what kind of stars we have out there. Let's go and find a proof. Yeah? While uh, well, other streams, uh, they are saying that uh, there's no a priori knowledge and uh, all mathematics is a result of uh, empirical uh, evidence. For example, the fact that 2 equals, uh, well, 2 equals nothing else than 2, but 2 plus 2 equals 4. Yeah? This is something which uh, we empirically learn. We uh, take two things, we take another two things, we put them together, we count, and there are four. Yeah. And uh, that's a little bit uh, the other uh, side of the camp. And of course, as usual, there are many camps. Uh, there's the logicist uh, camp, and uh, uh, well, then there are the constructivists. But uh, the main thing here is uh, that, uh, and now we're coming a little bit uh, back to the question about uh, the insights that the computer can generate, that uh, you can actually make experiments on uh, mathematical statements and see whether they hold. If you find a counterexample, you have disproven the statement, you actually know that it's false. And if you don't, and you have been trying hard, then maybe you have uh, gotten some idea that it holds. And then maybe you can actually uh, try to use the, the empirical uh, behavior of something to get some insight into how the mathematics works and come up with uh, uh, new uh, theories for that. Or also generate new statements, new things that uh, we could uh, be interested in, whether they're true or false. Yeah? So uh, experimental mathematics, uh, where you use uh, well, basically experiments, and nowadays you would do that with computers yeah, to check the statements for truth, they are uh, a way of uh, turning uh, mathematics into a more empirical science. Whether well, this is a good thing or a bad thing, <laughs> we're not going to find out today, but you're very uh, much invited to uh, come with some uh, views on that. Yeah. But wouldn't I call it more trial and error, so than experimental? Sorry? In experiments, you do an experiment. Yes. And either you get a false or, or a direct answer, which is okay, but it's actually nature. Yes. So I can have that, 10 different models of nature, one is going to be right by experiments. Wow, well, one, yeah, um, one yeah, might, might agree with all experiments. Is that more trial experiment. and error? It's more like trial and error? I mean, you try something, and it might be wrong, the statement. Is that trial and error mathematics? rather than experimental mathematics? Well, at least it, uh, it is where you start. But uh, the it's proponents right. of experimental mathematics, they actually argue uh, that uh, by doing this, you mimic what uh, every mathematician is anyway doing. <laughs> Mathematicians are going and thinking, oh, could this true hold true? Let's not, uh, try uh, for uh, some values. understand values. whether a better name is not experimental, but just physically trial and error. Trial and error. Well, mathematics yeah. is either, try, uh, either true or not. But also with uh, experimental sciences, if you think about theories, yeah, uh, you, you can say whether it's true or not. You cannot compare. Let's go and have an experiment, and uh, then we can see whether Einstein was right or not. Yeah. No, you well, can then you can. Different theories. <coughs> actually, the same experimental truth. That's different things. Here, mathematics is always true on its own. That's that's a view. Yeah, yeah, that's the Platonist view. <laughs> <laughs> now. Uh, how do we get uh, out of this mess? Yeah, we can this is a good mess, but uh, still, we need to somehow be constructive. Well, in the uh, 
after the uh, math of this uh, proof by Abel and Haken of the four color theory, uh, one of the critics, uh, Timochko, yeah, uh, he uh, said that uh, the proof is something that he would consider non survivable. And uh, he was then stating that he thinks a mathematical proof should uh, be convincing, surveyable, and formalizable. Yeah. Where convincing means uh, that it should convince you that it actually proves uh, uh, what you want uh, to prove, that it actually has a connection to the statement. Surveyability means that uh, as a human you can go and verify uh, your proof, you can understand all its part and you can uh, go through all of them. And the formalizability that you at least in principle can break down all the reasoning that happens in the proof yeah, into small formal uh, parts, formal operations in logic even if you didn't do that, but it should be possible. And uh, he was criticizing Apple and Haken that uh, the proof of the four color theorem, it's not su non survivable it's not feasible for humans to go through all these cases and understand whether this is all uh, correct. And uh, he also had some doubts about formalizability, yeah, whether you can go and formalize this proof. Before we come back to formalizability, uh, we come to another conjecture, the Robbins conjecture. And this is on uh, something that computer scientists love, Boolean algebra. And uh, one of the uh, sets of uh, statements from which, uh, or axioms from which you can derive uh, all of Boolean algebra, uh, that is uh, associativity, commutativity, and uh, this nice uh, equation, uh, which is, whoa, it's not the Huntington equation, that's the Robinson equation. Yeah? And uh, now, some guy called Huntington suggested that we use uh, this one instead. And uh, Robinson, and then he pro said uh, there would be a new kind of algebra uh, from this. And uh, Robinson, who actually came up with this equation, he uh, said, wait, I would uh, conjecture that this equation here, uh, together with associativity and commutativity, will give rise to the same algebra, to the same Boolean algebra. Well, it took until uh, 1996 uh, uh, for uh, proof of this uh, to be discovered, and was uh, discovered by an automatic theorem prover. That is a first order uh, logic based uh, uh, theorem prover that where you can give a statement in first order logic and it will uh, give you a proof, maybe, or maybe not. Yeah. Uh, in this case, it was able to prove that. And uh, well, there's a lot of questions that uh, come uh, up here. One is uh, whether we can trust the computer program, this uh, prover, EQP, and of course the answer is we shouldn't, yeah, because it's a software, it has bugs. Yeah. It evolved later into a, a tool called Otter, which uh, is uh, still uh, very competitive, and uh, uh, well, I've seen uh, how this has uh, had bugs uh, in uh, real world uh, competitions. So this is uh, not what we could do. Then, what about human verification? And human understanding? I mean, we would like maybe not to only to have a some kind of formal proof discovered, but would also like to understand how this uh, proof is actually built up and, uh, and what kind of theorem to lemma this corresponds to. So what uh, uh, happened here is that uh, uh, make a uh, uh, Sorry, just sorry. when you made your I said that, but yes. I was told when I was a kid that they can never construct an automatic demonstrator of theorems because you have always a famous <laughs> enunciator that you can never be able to prove like that. Are parallel lines parallel, right? So then you need actually a hierarchy of computers to be able to, de to decide on that. A famous example, I can have a perfectly well-defined grammatics, and I'm going to make a next statement We say, I'm a liar, decide. What yes. will the computer do? I know that actually it's impossible for a computer to do that unless it's an external input and decides whether the next postulate is part of the postulate or is a part of the demonstration. Isn't it true? That means that from the very beginning, your flow. So how do you do that? Well, I mean, the idea here is that uh, this only works in some cases. I mean, uh, you either, you, you, either you take a logic that is so oh, simple. I'm going to be paid, but I want to understand. Let's, let's, ta <laughs> let's take propositional logic, yeah, where you just have propositions and uh, Boolean operations on them. There, things are decidable, yeah, and you can actually, if you don't care about how fast it is, you can uh, go and decide the truth of every how statement. How does the computer knows whether I'm a liar or not? Well, this depends on how. I'm you. This depends on the... Uh, Again, what? given the set of the grammar rules, right? yes. it's perfectly well-defined grammatic statement to say I'm a liar. Yes. However, is it false or true, the statement? 
Yeah, but I mean, this example in logic that you actually cannot decide unless you have a friend telling you whether you're tired or not. That's a famous number one example of undecidability yes. that actually puts a com throws a computer off its own, you know. Uh, but this is own, this uh, is a cheap. So how do, how do you do that? Well, this is, is a this is a problem when you consider that you either want to have a general artificial intelligence or when you actually don't. Uh, I mean, that particular energy change could be part of your postulate or can be proven. Either way, you don't know. But if it's not yes. possible to be proven, the computer will never be able to find a solution. And that's fine because I mean, decide when that's fine. Oh, what the, is your statement for that's fine? That's fine. It's exactly it's it's fine if I can prove the statements uh, that I want to prove. <laughs> uh, so you know let's just uh, say, uh, actually, if you go away from this concrete question to my research, yeah, uh, I'm doing a, a lot of software <coughs> verification, and it's been shown that it's undecidable uh, oh. uh, whether two functions uh, uh, that are implemented in a different way uh, behave the same for all inputs. Yeah? It's undecidable. But that doesn't mean that you can't do this in concrete cases. In normal, interesting, concrete cases, which have not been constructed to be a uh, paradox or to demonstrate some kind of uh, right. undecidability, this uh, works. Yeah? So that's uh, exactly the same here. This automated theorem prover can not uh, sh show all the theorems. That's OK, because it can so show some theorems that we're actually interested so, so to prove. So correctly, so what you're saying, I'm trying to understand. Yeah? Because I know that it's impossible to build one. So you, and from what I heard, you said that you could. So the truth is you can't. But they're actually, in certain cases, useful. Is that correct? Is That's correct? A, well, a good summary. I agree with that. But yes. I, mean, I, 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 don't, I know theorems cannot be violated. So you cannot construct something you cannot construct. Oh, don't worry. I am. Uh, I'm solving undecidable problems uh, every day. That's, uh, yeah, was, I, that's I, I, a part of what we used to say when I was, I was a PhD student. Yeah. Uh, what is the undecidable problem of the day? Let's take a decidable fragment which is relevant for our problem. Let's uh, solve that. Yeah. And then we just have to care about efficiency, which is uh, another beast which we're not getting into here much. Um, <coughs> good. But actually, someone sat down and pro uh, <coughs> produced a proof. Uh, human read it all yeah, with lemmata and proofs and uh, then a theorem that is proven based uh, on uh, the other lemmata and uh, the theorems that had been proven before. This is uh, still not very easy to survey but you can follow this. This is a paper of uh, some dozens uh, of uh, pages and uh, I've actually looked through that uh, just to be sure that I would consider that surveyable. So in this case it was uh, still possible to go and uh, uh, take the output of the computer and uh, uh, with a, a lot of work uh, formalize this uh, in readable mathematics. Now, uh, what are we going to do in general when we're thinking of our smoking gun of the 200 terabytes uh, proof? Yeah? Mm -hmm. This is not going to work for the 200 terabyte proof because it will take 10 billion years to go through it for a mathematician. So it will take even more time to make a paper out of it. Plus. Uh, We'll, they'll have a problem with submitting the paper because they usually have size limits, yeah? page limit or <coughs> size of the file or things like this. Microfilm is not a solution either. <laughs> now, uh, what is the solution? Well, the solution is uh, to use formalization and then rethink things a little bit. And we'll take this in two steps. We'll start uh, by looking at formalization. Well, if you formalize the proofs, then uh, you uh, you describe them in a formal language where you have axioms, you have assumptions, and you have inference rules. And uh, then you syntactically apply the rules, and uh, uh, then you can get from your axioms uh, and uh, your assumptions uh, to via the inference rules uh, to the truth uh, of a statement under these assumptions. Yeah? Now, as we already have been input, uh, this cannot uh, always work. Yeah? They are, for any interesting uh, uh, logics, there are uh, things that uh, you can't uh, generate by this. Well, people would disagree, but they would find some logic that they think is interesting. But that's for theorem, and this is the ability. So any axiomatic definition of mathematics contains always axiom for which you cannot be uh, decided upon. It's a theorem. Right. Yeah, that if you have enough axioms, that you have enough power to you know do interesting axioms. mathematics. The question is what uh, you would consider there this would to be, be interesting. I can uh, take propositional logic. It's maybe not interesting enough to axiomatize mathematics, yeah? uh, but uh, uh, some people find this interesting. Now, uh, finding proofs, even if they can be made in this way, is uh, usually uh, very hard. 
yeah? uh, because uh, there's a whole space of uh, possibilities to explore. I mean, all possible inferences that you can take at uh, some step in your proof, and then this is branching. At each step, you can do a lot of different things, which means that, uh, and you don't know, you don't have a limit on the size of the proof. Yeah? Uh, so this is really infeasible uh, for uh, many things, even if it worked uh, for uh, the Robbins conjecture, which is a really, you know, it's a really small uh, uh, thing to prove uh, here compared to some of the other things that you might want to prove. But we observe one thing here, that checking proofs is usually much easier than finding them. Because once I have a proof, for example, up there is a proof that, uh, well, starting from uh, the axiom that uh, Socrates is a man and, uh, well, the uh, other axiom that uh, you can either be a man or a mortal and uh, the assumption that Socrates is not mortal, yeah, you can actually reason yourself uh, using inference called uh, resolution yeah, uh, to that Socrates is mortal and then another step to that uh, uh, the assumption that uh, Socrates is mortal is actually uh, false. Yeah? And by this you refute actually this uh, statement. So you can use this to prove or disprove uh, statements. Yeah? And uh, now uh, finding this proof it can be much harder because you have a lot of uh, th things that you know and uh, it can be a hard uh, way to uh, build uh, this kind of uh, tree which will end in true or in false. Yeah? But uh, checking that is not so hard. You just need to go and then check. Are these uh, axioms or assumptions? And then are each of these steps here okay? Now, uh, we had some doubts about uh, can you formalize uh, the four color theorem? Can you represent that in some kind of formal system? Uh, they were voiced uh, after uh, it was presented in 1977. Well, uh, this uh, is uh, something that Gontier uh, answered in 2008. Well, actually, he did the work uh, earlier. He started in 2000 and I think finished in 2005, but that's when the paper <coughs> journal article got accepted yeah, and published. Now, uh, first he tried actually to prove the computer program correct that uh, Apple and Harkin had uh, used. Uh, because this was the biggest issue. The biggest issue was not the proof of uh, you can reduce it to 1,936 cases. The biggest issue was uh, once we have these 1,936 cases, did the computer really show that all of them are okay? That they all can be colored by four colors? Yeah? And, uh, well, he found out that this was very uh, hard and that anyway it would not give the full proof. So instead, he made a full formalization in the theorem prover Koch. Uh, and, uh, well, he did the formalization of the reduction. People had worked on this in the meantime, had found better ways of reducing it to fewer cases. So uh, he could actually formalize the reduction to 633 cases. And he made a proof, a formalized proof, that these cases are unavoidable. That means whenever you have a smallest counterexample uh, to uh, uh, this uh, four color abilities or something that would need five colors, well, then it has to contain one of these 633 cases. And then as a third thing, he formalized uh, that uh, all of these 633 cases are four colorable. Yeah? Now, the good thing of doing that is that now we don't need to trust some strange program written by Apple and Harkin in 1977, but uh, only, only yeah, the uh, interactive theorem prover Koch. Well, Koch is based on the calculus of inductive constructions, uh, and uh, it has a very, very small kernel. It's like a one page uh, of uh, code, approximately uh, understandable uh, code, and this has been <coughs> by hand, uh, and I think later also formally, uh, uh, using another uh, theorem prover, been proven to be correct. And if this piece of code is correct, then it does not accept uh, proofs, for example, the full proof of the four color theorem, uh, <coughs> which have any flaws. Yeah? So uh, we have reduced uh, what we need to trust to a very small uh, computer program. Yeah? There are still discussions uh, about what we still need to trust. We need to trust uh, the program that compiles this. We need to trust uh, the com uh, operating system and the hardware this, this runs on. But this can be uh, mitigated a little bit by considering to run on different hardware using different uh, compilers. Yeah? Uh, and uh, well, also by that this theorem provers like uh, Koch, we will see another one, Isabel soon, have been used for many, many uh, problems and uh, uh, they are very well checked. Uh, so in this way, we have increased the trust, although, of course, there's no final uh, certainty. Now, uh, another 
proof, a relatively famous computer assisted proof, is the Kepler conjecture. And we'll see in a second uh, why uh, I'm uh, starting to talk about this. But what is it about? It is about taking spheres, let's call them balls, yeah, and packing them as tight as possible in three dimensional space. Yeah? And uh, the conjecture was that uh, there are two different packings which are both, which are both optimal the cubic closed packing and the hexagonal uh, closed packing. And uh, they are represented here. Yeah? And uh, these uh, two packings, they are both uh, optimal. And uh, while well, this is something that Johannes Kepler conjectured in the 17th century, 16 something, yeah? and uh, Thomas Hales finally, after many, many people tried for hundreds of uh, 300 years, yeah? has uh, proven uh, in 1998. And the referees of that uh, article, they were 99% sure, they wrote in their reviews, yeah, uh, that the proof is a proof. <coughs> but they weren't entirely sure. Yeah. So uh, Hales uh, then started a formalization project, uh, which he estimated to last for 20 years. Yeah. Luckily, it was a little bit faster. So he started in January 2003 and finished in August 2014, 13 years and uh, seven months. Yeah, uh, for formalizing uh, the proof of the Kepler conjecture. And uh, they used another interactive theorem prover, Isabel uh, Hall, which is, uh, well, less French and more uh, German. Uh, <coughs> I'm not going to say more that uh, <laughs> I, I know the guys behind all of them. Yeah. So I have to be careful where I'm uh, treating. Uh, I'm usually using uh, cock, but this is also an excellent uh, and very trusted theorem prover. So, so the 99% suggests, of course, that there's a certain amount of intuition also going into evaluating. There were the proof there were steps that uh, the referees thought were uh, logically sound, but that they could not uh, really um, argue down to the level of uh, formal logics. Yeah where they were saying, I believe that is, this is the case, but I'm not sure. Yeah? And uh, well, the <coughs> formalization uh, took care of all of that. This is probably one of the most uh, ambitious uh, formalizations in terms of size of the formalization, not in terms of the size of the proof. Yeah? Uh, which uh, brings us uh, back to our goal to verify the 200 terabyte Pythagorean triples proof. Yeah? Uh, or to formalize it, or to somehow be sure that this, what these uh, crazy guys in uh, Texas act did, this actually constitutes a mathematical proof. Yeah? Now it's infeasible to formalize the proof, because uh, the proof in a very compact representation takes 200 terabytes of storage. Yeah? Uh, putting this into a, uh, some kind of formal logic will uh, blow it up to petabytes uh, of uh, size, and there are no uh, theorem provers, automated, interactive, that are able to deal with uh, proofs of uh, several gigabytes. Yeah? There are definitely none that can deal with terabytes. Yeah? And uh, petabytes is completely off the chart. Yeah? So uh, we had to come up with some good idea how to do that. And uh, after reading about this proof, uh, my uh, colleague uh, uh, Luis uh, Cruz Felipe, and uh, well, I was uh, visiting uh, guy in Portugal, uh, uh, he's a professor there who's actually working on satisfiability of propositional logic. Yeah? We were also discussing this proof and we really were like, okay, we need to do this. Yeah? Uh, this is really something that, uh, we, we don't believe this. I mean, maybe it's right, but uh, this is not a proof. Yeah? Um, and uh, this really stretches the limits too far. So what was uh, the idea that we came up with? We came up with the idea of saying, instead of trying to formalize all the proof, yeah, Let's automate the surveying process, the process of going through the proof and checking that the proof is actually a proof. Yeah? And uh, well, that means uh, formalizing the process of uh, proof checking. Yeah? Having a proof checker which we then prove uh, using COP or Isabel or another interactive uh, theorem prover to be correct and uh, use this proof checker to find out whether these 200 terabytes are actually a proof of the uh, Boolean Pythagorean triples conjecture, as it's so nicely called, or not. Yeah? And uh, well, to handle the 2 terabytes, we then had to tune both the proof and the proof checker for efficiency, meaning we actually blew up the proof from 200, just under 200 terabyte to nearly 400 terabytes, adding extra information. Imagine like when you're doing mathematics by hand and you 
you can have some kind of intermediate calculations. We added this kind of intermediate information to the proof, yeah, such that the steps would be easier to verify. And uh, well, then we did some more standard computer science optimizations on the checker and proved uh, again and again that this is still a valid proof checker. That if this proof checker says these 200 terabytes are proof, then the 200 terabytes are a mathematical proof uh, of the uh, Ribault's conjecture. So technically, you made a referee. That's the first automated referee. Basically, it's an automated yeah, referee. Cool. Yes. And, uh, you know, finally, get rid of uh, people. We don't have to waste time anymore referring people. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. unfortunately not going to work for all problems, but it, it would work on this uh, <laughs> Erdős uh, conjecture. <laughs> Uh, that was uh, proven in 2014 with a 47 gigabyte uh, or 4.7 gigabyte, I don't remember, proof. Yeah. Now, having done that, we were actually able to use a supercomputer yeah, uh, with this fully verified, formalized uh, proof checker uh, running on the, uh, many uh, of the nodes of the supercomputer on many, many of the cores in there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then in uh, 1378 CPU days, we actually uh, read it the proof independently that uh, the Texan guys did and tuned it to blow it up to these nearly 400 terabytes. And then another 2,608 CPU days uh, we uh, verified using this uh, automated mathematician, if you want, the automated referee, yeah, uh, these uh, 389 terabytes uh, of uh, proof. And uh, well, given that Abacus is a pretty nice uh, supercomputer, uh, the runtime for all of this uh, was on the order of uh, four days, I think, two and a half days for this uh, less, uh, for the first uh, step. Yeah. So let's uh, nice. You go from four years for referring to four days. See? Yeah. Or from ten billion years <laughs> to four days. <laughs> to four days. Yeah. Yes. Amazing. Yeah. Pretty cool. And uh, well. And so the artificial the mathematician then. Uh, would the journal paper the bill of uh, Abacus? Abacus was not in the job. The free, yeah. But, uh, this, uh, oh, this is uh, this is uh, from an article uh, uh, in the uh, engineer where uh, well this was before we. No, no. I mean, if, whether it, whether this is marketable, whether the uh, whether the journals would love to pay for referees that can ah, answer in four days. That's pay for a running a consumer good. Well, given that uh, it requires <laughs> the proof to be in some uh, machine readable <laughs> format that uh, the referee can do, but yes, uh, that would of course uh, be nice. <coughs> it is uh, in general the question of uh, how are we going to handle the, I mean, the increasing number of computer assisted uh, proofs. Yeah, uh, that is a discussion in the community, and uh, it's discussed uh, uh, in the mathematics uh, community where people do computer assisted proof. It's also discussed uh, in the uh, proof theory community, it's discussed uh, in the automated reasoning community, so there are many communities where, well, they have all the different views on this, that's uh, the nice uh, part, uh, of course. A question on that, you know, I was thinking about verification. Yes. Uh, so, have you used uh, known proofs as verification? For example, a Hilbert uh, proof or something like that. So you actually say, I can verify the program works by showing on known cases, I can, the computer can actually complete the same proof. You use this at all? Uh, not in this case, but no, uh, I'm not, I'm but this could be used. Yeah. Do you use it? No. Okay. So this is uh, uh, completely bottom up. Yeah. The only thing that we're using is uh, the correctness proof of the uh, calculus of in, uh, constructive uh, inductive construction. Now. Uh, well, I mean, actually, this is a good uh, uh, place where I can ask you if you have any questions to the uh, 200 terabyte proof or its verification, because uh, afterwards I'm going to broaden the focus a little bit. So, so when you send, so what, wouldn't you need actually uh, a reviewer of the reviewer? I mean, according to the <laughs> 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 which is actually Francesco's point. Yeah. Exactly. A review of the reviewer. So you exactly. would say who would uh, check it for the checker. Who would check the checker? Yeah. yeah. Well, that is uh, the, the good thing that with this checker is that uh, this uh, checker is, of course, being published uh, uh, in a journal right now, and uh, I think it's accepted for publication. And uh, it has been going through a reviewing process. Yeah. yeah but uh, also, and it has also the, the, the algorithm was published. I mean, the, 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 the first proof was. was uh, I mean, it's a published algorithm or a published uh, thing. I mean, so it's. I mean. 
You can always say, I mean, yes, I don't trust it. But, it, but, it, but I, I'm 100% sure that the referees uh, of the original article uh, with the 20 terabyte proof, they did not survey the proof. I'm uh, very sure on that. While uh, I'm uh, pretty sure uh, that uh, uh, at least uh, some of the uh, referees that we had uh, for uh, our uh, work here have uh, read the entire uh, checker. Yeah, but they actually yeah. came with yeah, some. But, but in uh, principle, we still restore. I mean, so, 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 so there's a logical problem. Yeah, that's logical. Can, can you prove something that wasn't correct? Yes. That is, I hope we can. No? I hope you can, but I mean, the question is, you know, make sure that the checker is correct. You should also check that if I have a wrong proof of something, that yes. actually the checker okay. shows that it's proof. It's wrong. I mean, what, I, what we can guarantee is if the checker says that it's a proof, then it's a proof. This is the only thing that we formalized and proved. We did not prove uh, uh, what, uh, if it says that uh, it's not a proof, whether this is uh, 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 actually uh, the case or uh, whether uh, it can still be a proof. So only in the case of a uh, affirmative answer, uh, th there we have a uh, guarantee that it's uh, uh, is a proof. I mean, I, since I don't know anything about this, yes. your specific papers, the first one, but can I ask a specific question? Yes. When you say proof is a proof, it could also just mean that it's not proven to be wrong, but that doesn't mean that automatically it's right. Yes, but this case... Right? Yes, and, and that's exactly uh, what, what uh, we are doing. What, what we are, uh, we're not looking for uh, counterexamples and uh, uh, saying there's no counterexample. Yeah. We are, in this case, it is really a resolution proof uh, okay. on the level of uh, this one here. So yeah. the logic is correct. The logic is correct. It doesn't mean the proof is right. Uh, I, I no. have a logically correct statement, right. but that's okay. the statement, not need to be right. Right, <coughs> but the statement... Do you like another reference? <laughs> but we have the, the sequence of inferences yeah. that are made. And this is actually what constitutes the 200 uh, terabytes. And the whole point is that we go through all these uh, 200 terabytes of inferences and check each inference. Yeah. And what is nice here is that it is really a very simple uh, piece uh, of code that is actually making this check, uh, check because we put in all the intermediate, uh, oh, wrong one, all the intermediate uh, information into the proof, yeah? which means this is really as difficult as uh, saying, uh, but it's, it's basic set theory where you have uh, addition of one element to a set and you have uh, set uh, difference, these two operations. That's uh, the two only operations that the, the checker needs uh, for this uh, proof. How, I mean, how independent on the specific proof it is? Imagine that somebody comes with a different or something. Yes, uh, the answer to that is it's completely de dependent, oh, well, but, yeah. but, yeah, uh, there's, more and more proofs which uh, use a set solver uh, uh, as uh, uh, the means of actually finding a certificate or of showing up absence of exhausting a search space. And all the ones that use a set solver, we can uh, uh, use this uh, for. So for example, uh, uh, this uh, Erdos uh, conjecture, uh, we could uh, uh, also verify that it was just not as impressive as the 200 uh, terabytes. So uh, the answer is if you use a set solver to uh, uh, exhaust the search space, uh, then uh, our checker can, without any extra work, give you a guarantee that this exhaustion was correct. It will not tell you whether this exhaustion in your proof context has any other meaning than that. This is something that we needed to do additional and also uh, which was specific to the uh, proof. But this was something that took a couple of days uh, to do. Good. Now. Uh, the dessert, where we are leaving the mathematical proofs, and we're coming uh, generally to artificial intelligence, and uh, I call it taming artificial intelligence. Uh, well, it, this is uh, maybe a little bit uh, over the top. Uh, it goes uh, the same direction uh, as any reasonable, uh, well-behaved uh, Terminator movie. Yeah, machines uh, starting uh, to fight with us. Yeah, but uh, there are some much more real problems. Uh, or oh, this is actually something that can happen. Also, but uh, this is actually uh, what I'm looking uh, at here is much more uh, on the line of automation of uh, human labor and machine learning. Let's start with uh, the automation of human labor. Yeah, this is an old uh, uh, but very nice article where, uh, well, which you can say is uh, completely uh, uh, unreliable, and this, no one has proven that this is true. Yeah, but this is an estimation of uh, which. Uh, 
jobs uh, have uh, what kind of probability of being uh, uh, optimized here or uh, not being optimized uh, within a certain uh, time frame. I don't remember how many decades, but not many. Yeah? And as you can see, uh, this uh, management and engineering uh, and education and uh, these kind of things, uh, they're uh, on the low probability uh, up here. Yeah? And then there's a, a high probability for all these uh, service uh, things, sales and service and administrative support and uh, yeah, these kind of things. And then there's a middle ground with also a lot of uh, potential uh, for the more physical jobs. Right? Now, uh, how does this uh, work? The oldest uh, way of uh, replacing human labor is uh, probably uh, by using expert uh, systems. Yeah? This is one of the first success stories of artificial intelligence. Where the idea is that you look at human reasoning processes, how does a doctor diagnose uh, some uh, kind of uh, 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 medical condition based on symptoms. Yeah? While uh, he goes and he checks, does it have these symptoms and is this blood value over or under this value and so on. And these systems, they mimic uh, this kind of uh, reasoning. And this has been very uh, successful in clinical decision support. This is uh, actually only now we roll it out on a wider, wider basis uh, in different uh, countries, uh, but uh, it uh, has been, people have been working on this for 40 plus years. Yeah? Credit risk assessment, uh, piloting uh, some kind of craft, aircraft or uh, boats or whatever automatically, yeah? where depending on what kind of conditions you find, you have to make different decisions. Yeah? This is uh, challenging for humans to verify whether the decisions made by these systems are good. But it's not impossible. Yeah. Right. I mean, when you say successful, do you mean that it is used more and more? Uh, or do you mean that uh, it actually improves? Uh, for example, credit risk assessment. Yes. Uh, it's not clear that it actually improves the risk assessment, but it is clear it, it is used more and more. Um, successful in the sense of uh, this is uh, being used more and more. Yeah. Okay. I'm not uh, uh, going to. Uh, uh, judge whether that's a good idea or not. We can say that it's successful also in the sense of that it gives really good results when we look at uh, autopilots. Yeah? They can do amazing uh, things. Yeah? Uh, but, uh, uh, but I could also argue about that. And, uh, uh, the, but uh, credit risk assessment, I'm more skeptical myself too. Yeah? The clinical decision support is, is mostly a matter of uh, how much uh, the persons do actually rely on this yeah? versus uh, you know, uh, blind faith versus uh, using this as a supportive tool. Yeah, so that's uh, of course uh, in the applications this is hard to judge. But what is uh, possible here is even if they uh, have a lot of knowledge in there and a lot of rules and stuff, you can always come with a trace saying that I say that this guy, uh, person should be tested for diabetes too because uh, of these, these, and these reasons. That's why the system came to this conclusion. Now fast forward to 2014 plus, that's where we're living, yeah. Uh, closer to singularity if you believe to some, far away if you believe others. Uh, machine learning, this is uh, one of the new blacks, yeah. And uh, there are two uh, mainstreams have been for a long time, at least uh, when I studied uh, this uh, in uh, Trondheim in 1999, there were already these two streams. One based on statistical learning, yeah, and one based on neural networks, yeah. And uh, in both cases, you get uh, correlations and you get uh, some uh, interesting effects without uh, actually understanding what happens uh, in there, without getting some explanations. And uh, this is also gaining traction in many fields. That is uh, uh, the way uh, success is measured. Yeah? So uh, this is used a lot in big data analytics uh, for predictive maintenance in autonomous systems. You look at the Tesla cars when they're uh, autopiloting, they're doing this not based on expert systems but on autonomous systems. Yeah, and uh, <coughs> kill the F. And uh, currently, it is not uh, feasible to formally verify uh, what uh, such uh, machine learning based uh, artificial intelligence systems uh, tell you. So, if th this uh, artificial intelligence, uh, even based on deep learning with the neural networks that take care of the feature extraction and whatever. If they tell you the best decision in this case is to do this, yeah, then you don't know why it was deciding like this, and you also have no way of uh, verifying that this is actually a good decision versus uh, 
there's uh, something wrong in the neural network uh, simulation uh, software uh, or in the, your statistical uh, learning package. Yes? Uh, is verification strictly necessary in all cases? No, absolutely not. Thanks for the question. I had uh, this on the on the slide. I'm not sure <coughs> it's uh, coming. No, but uh, verification is uh, interesting in uh, safety critical applications. Yeah, is it uh, human health or is it uh, uh, flying a plane uh, not into uh, some mountain? Yeah, there uh, there's also uh, a demand for validation and verification uh, from uh, laws in many countries. Yeah. But of course, uh, if you just want to have some prediction on when to go out to your windmill and uh, replace some parts in order to avoid it breaks down, and you have to unscalably fly a helicopter there on Sunday evening, yeah, then of course you're welcome to just believe into the system. Yeah, but the question is, if you have an application where you need to verify this, how are you going to do this? Before we come back to that, I have a short look at the future. And uh, <coughs> well, there's. Uh, this uh, widely held view popularized by uh, Jay Kurzweil, is he Jay Kurzweil? Ray, probably, uh, who uh, has been claiming for quite some time that uh, the power, the reasoning power of machines is going to exceed the ones of uh, humans uh, at some point of time in the near future. And uh, currently, the prediction is on 2023. Yeah. Has been on earlier dates before, yeah, and on later dates also. Yeah. And uh, then, this will accelerate the growth because then when we have human level intelligence we can the systems can improve themselves yeah? and this is all based on uh, the exponential account Trump, right? sorry this doesn't take into account Trump. <laughs> no. and this is all based on uh, this uh, exponential growth of computing power that we have been observing uh, in the last uh, uh, many decades last 40 years actually yeah known as uh, moore's law now the uh, Moore's law basically states that the number of transistors per area uh, doubles uh, every uh, 24 months and then a newer version that was corrected to 18 months. Yeah? Uh, but it has been taken as an exponential growth in computing uh, power. Now, since uh, the last five years, we have uh, been starting to question whether this growth actually uh, will continue. And if you look at uh, the numbers and start uh, uh, making some regressions here, you can see that uh, actually the clock speed of uh, uh, the transistors and uh, also uh, the power that is used are starting to level off to a certain uh, degree and uh, there's uh, still the transistor per chip which is uh, looking quite uh, well until uh, two years ago but this is also starting to look uh, non-sustainable uh, so there are I think three more scheduled generations of uh, shrinking that uh, Intel uh, and AMD have uh, on their plans and uh, then they are really hitting some hard limits like the uh, size of atoms uh, uh, and uh, things uh, like that. Yeah. Uh, so we already hit the wall of uh, uh, increasing frequency uh, using uh, excessive uh, power and uh, giving problems with uh, uh, distances because the speed of light is finite, it's fast, but not infinite. Yeah. And uh, now we are also going to get problems with the number of transistors. So it's a little bit unclear whether we will uh, see this growth over uh, the next uh, 40 years that we've seen in the last 40 years. And uh, so the predictions here, they can also look uh, much uh, more conservative uh, than uh, Kurzweil's uh, uh, fantasies. We will find out uh, what happens uh, here. I'm personally uh, somewhere in the middle. I think uh, we will see uh, a, an increase, not necessarily only based on hardware, but also on better uh, use of this hardware on better algorithms and uh, uh, new insights uh, like deep learning which really gave a push uh, uh, compared to, to uh, neural networks before. Now uh, what's next uh, on my agenda? What is uh, the idea that I'm uh, currently uh, pursuing? Well that is uh, automating the verification of artificial intelligence. Yeah? There are situations where you need uh, safety critical systems or systems that need, need to be reliable. But there are also other cases when, for example, administrative decisions are made, uh, where the law mandates that these decisions need to be uh, explained to the citizens. For example, if a system at the municipality will say that this person should not uh, get uh, more than this many crowns in uh, uh, what uh, is content yield called? Good question. Yeah. In uh, uh, 
unemployment insurance is the wrong word that would be, I don't know, let's say in unemployment insurance, yeah, there's some kind of uh, 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 decision like this made by machine learning. Yeah? Uh, we need to be able to explain uh, to the citizen why was this decision made. Yeah? And uh, in general, if we accumulate all kinds of knowledge by finding correlations uh, and getting training neural networks and these kind of things, we, we know a lot, but this knowledge is tacit. We can't really get insights from this knowledge. We can't uh, use this knowledge except for uh, what uh, the system has been uh, trained to do. And uh, that's why uh, one of uh, the things that I'm interested in, and uh, whoever else thinks this is interesting is uh, very happily invited to join me on this uh, course, to uh, go and verify or explain uh, the decisions uh, made by artificial intelligences based on machine learning. And, uh, well, of course we will need, this will be a big task. These are big systems with a lot of data, yeah. So the ideas that uh, uh, we used to verify these 200 terabytes of uh, mathematical proof, I want to take these ideas and use them to build some kind of artificial intelligence that can actually look at the results of machine learning and uh, gather insights uh, or explain what is happening there. So basically AI to help us understand AI. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for a very nice presentation. And, uh, uh, any questions? <coughs> of course. Uh, well, if you look at proof verification, we shouldn't be too surprised because mathematics is done exactly so that we have uh, constructed proofs to be verifiable. Or by constructed proofs. Yes, also that. But then, if you look at uh, how uh, a mathematician would work, it's, it's very unclear. I mean, you have true statements that are not provable, and you might not be sure about your foundation. So I don't, I don't still see how we could be replaced by computers. How does a computer take uh, a question in number theory and solve it? Well, uh, there, there are two uh, questions here. Yes. One is uh, coming uh, back uh, to this one. Yeah. Uh, well, the mathematicians, uh, that's uh, this one here, yeah? they're uh, the ones with the low uh, probability uh, of uh, unemployment. And uh, as I said, this is a provocative uh, title. Yeah? They're, I think we, we should think of uh, computers here as uh, helping us uh, uh, to, uh, in certain situations also of get generating new statements and insights. But this is not uh, going to replace us uh, anytime soon. Uh, and, uh, I mean by us, the scientists, yeah? uh, we are probably among the safest uh, in this regard. Yeah? But, That's yeah? probably, <laughs> That's probably. probably. <laughs> yeah. not all scientists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're, they're I, 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 it's the way you think. <laughs> yes, we're not going to go on that. But uh, the second part of the question is, uh, can a computer go and prove something about number theory? Well, yes, yeah. there are uh, systems that can do that. Question is, are they going to prove anything that is so interesting uh, that uh, you find this worthwhile and you wouldn't have been able to do it yourself? Uh, there have been a few cases, uh, uh, very well publicized then, yeah, <coughs> where computers have found uh, interesting proofs that uh, humans have not. Yeah, uh, But uh, if it's more about the complexity uh, of the proof, but not the complexity in size, but complexity in hardness, I think we still have the edge. Let's see how long. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in, uh, in possible applications of an artificial intelligence in government and in the upper echelons of, of, of how, how power is sorted. Uh, and how far do you think, well, could there be a difference between a computer as a tool and a computer that gives us orders? Not necessarily in a tyrannical way, but in more like an operating system that can teach each generation what the generation before them knew. Sort of like a, a, like a grandmother. <laughs> Right? Well, you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm trying to say? But, I mean, yes, I know what you're talking about. I, I would say that, uh, well, I mean, we are, we are getting there. 
I mean, uh, machine learning uh, based uh, artificial intelligences uh, are being rolled out uh, in administration. Uh, they are being rolled out uh, in a lot of business uh, contexts uh, now. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the more this will become standard, we will also see this, uh, for example, in educational uh, uh, constructions. And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, once we will start uh, letting uh, computers uh, uh, support teachers in the schools, yeah? in a way we are already doing that, but by more intelligent uh, computer programs, yeah, they actually can uh, go and see what does the student understand and present it at the right level yeah, and uh, actually have a dialogue with the student and to teach. Well, from there it's not a long way to the scenario that uh, you're talking about because uh, if we will find that uh, the computers are becoming better and better at uh, doing this, yeah, we will uh, start letting them uh, teach us in universities, we will start letting uh, them take our decisions uh, in uh, first administration, then uh, in the executive uh, branches uh, also, yeah, and uh, then of course there's the whole long uh, list of questions which are how can we prevent them from uh, becoming evil? Yeah, there's a. <laughs> Maybe an, I don't know. If you haven't been in a driverless, you know, you ready in the hands of artificial And it, it, you, it, you, through, you, you live your own life. In Right, but can we replace the politicians with computers? That would, that would be nice. Already now. Personally, that would be my goal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, we first have to figure out how we prevent uh, them from going evil. There was this case of this uh, machine learning based AI that was uh, uh, learning from uh, uh, on Twitter and then it became really, really nasty. Yeah? And I, I don't want this to happen to uh, even the AI in a, a self-driving car. Uh, I mean, we have enough problems with terrorists uh, of all kinds of uh, colors to drive uh, into uh, people. Yeah, we don't need uh, an army of uh, self-driving cars. Yes. I mean, it's it's somewhat related to this discussion. So, I was thinking it would be nice if you have, if not a proof, but a structured statement relating to which classes of problems that computers. Uh, can solve and which classes they are cannot solve or they're not very efficient at. There are some hints. Uh, some colleagues in Austria. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> fair enough. But there are some hints. Some colleagues in Austria uh, published an article, mm -hmm. uh, Nature, fairly recently. They said, okay, the computers are very good if you define with some structure a problem space and let them loose within that. But mm -hmm. with respect to discovering new problem spaces. They yeah. suck bigly. So far. Uh, and the question is, are you or anybody else making any attempt to curb your enthusiasm by looking into uh, to a theory about what problems it can solve? I think there are people who are looking into that, uh, but uh, I uh, Personally, I have not been looking into that uh, much because I'm actually not the one who is going and uh, letting AI loose uh, on uh, lots of uh, problems, whether it's a good idea or not. Sorry, I'm I'm a, no, no, I'm, I'm just saying that from my perspective, yeah, the, the interesting question is when someone is, is using uh, artificial intelligence uh, to put uh, their lives into uh, that hands in a self driving car. Example, for example, a very practical example. If we are at university and there are some strategic funds to be put somewhere, yes. could artificial intelligence, based on how quality of the researchers here are and what they have, actually distribute the funds so that actually the funds are given to the high impact researchers? This is. There's a. <laughs> this is a very concrete question. Which I would answer that uh, this is probably not the best allocation. It, it might actually find another allocation that has the <laughs> best. Impact. Take it <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's the one where we don't favor the high impact uh, researchers uh, who already have funding. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Uh, I, I think we sort of skipped the beat uh, because we went from uh, you know you describing how they can uh, solve the problem. Yes. to them being able to identify the problem in the first place. And I think that's also sort of your question, yes. Yes. That, that there is also like some creativity which is important because coming up with a good solution and, and actually going through the entire data set of uh, finding these knots and seeing if they're monochromatic is one thing, but you know, uh, stating the theorem in the first place, 
uh, is also an interesting question, I suppose. That's now, probably the most interesting. Yes, and I, I, you're not a neuroscientist, but but, but um, so it's maybe more of a philosophical question. But but do you do you have any idea if this is possible to go from the specific case to the general case? I am pretty sure that uh, there's uh, this is possible. Yeah. The question is, when are we going to see this? Mm. Yeah. Are we going to go extinct before? Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> yeah. But uh, okay, without uh, that uh, side remark, um, it, it is. Uh, I, I don't believe there's any general uh, thing in the way for, for us to uh, go and simulate uh, uh, or, or model or somehow uh, in another way uh, perform similar uh, kind of activities than the human brain does. Yeah. Uh, so in this way. Uh, eventually, uh, we will uh, get to a stage where we can uh, simulate a human thought process uh, or something better or similar. Yeah, uh, but uh, this is of course uh, uh, way uh, beyond uh, uh, what we will see in the next couple of years. Yeah, uh, there's uh, this distinction between artificial specialized intelligence and artificial generalized intelligence, and what we're seeing right now is uh, that. Uh, at least for the specialized uh, intelligence, just by raw computing power, we can get uh, systems to do any task uh, that is somewhat structured better than uh, humans. Yeah, and tasks that are not so structured and are more creative. Actually, there's also quite a bit of progress. This is something that I personally find amusing, but not, uh, which I don't spend a lot of time uh, on. But it's it's when you start using computers to write poems and uh, paint, uh, well, or create pictures and. Uh, in general, uh, uh, create art, and there are actually some uh, pretty interesting uh, results uh, on that uh, front, which uh, make me personally optimistic that creativity is not something that is somehow beyond explanation. Yeah? But, possible. but uh, if you look at uh, going from something that has a specialized uh, intelligence to a general intelligence, then the biggest difference uh, is uh, that. Uh, the intelligence needs to be aware of all the context and all the connection between concepts. Yeah, and there's a wonderful uh, comparison uh, that they uh, made. I would like to keep it. I mean, because other people want to ask questions. Okay, very very short answer. Yes. Uh, the short answer to this is: uh, look for uh, IQ shootout uh, on different uh, existing AIs uh, uh, with humans, and you will find that uh, the strongest one, Google Brain, right now, which uh, as a general uh, AI, yeah, uh, is. Uh, on the st stage of a five-year-old child, approximately. Yeah. And uh, that means uh, somewhere around 47 IQ, if you compare it to a grown-up person. So now, very, very, very short. Very yeah, short. very fast. Uh, and it has doubled the last two years. Like I want to reformulate the, that some questions that uh, people have done, like the oracle, uh, like of the Greek uh, <laughs> I was thinking, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, the point is, how do you handle the Polanyi's paradox, and what do you think in the because that is a graph of next uh, 2050 uh, years is kind of wrong that graph, uh, but so para Polanyi's paradox and uh, uh, the, what do you think about patent copyrights uh, uh, when we look at the trend of the innovation growth? Because if I know that all the uh, algorithms will be in the future, I would like to redistribute that knowledge. But the West innovation is going down. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. let's start with the paradox. Can you uh, remind we me know of that? No, but but then, yeah. since this will take some time, okay. I can ask. Sorry, I guess the okay, idea. about the, pet, uh, the copyright, what yes. do you think? In terms of, because we should decrease the years of the property of the ownership of the Google's yes. algorithm. I, I think uh, if you're looking at the speed of innovation, yeah. Yeah, there are some uh, very nice uh, logarithmic graphs which are showing how, uh, which impact we're getting in the, uh, uh, in the what amount of time. And, and this is increasing, uh, the speed of this is increasing so much that uh, I would argue that concepts uh, uh, such as uh, 70 years of copyright and stuff like that are completely anachronistic. Yeah? And, uh, well, we only have them that long actually because of Disney, but uh, that's another aspect. But I think we need to rethink uh, uh, intellectual property. Mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, uh, also uh, the, the question of uh, who, is, uh, who is going to profit uh, from uh, the automation uh, of labor. And, and then we're coming to uh, the, 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 all the area of uh, uh, citizen salaries and uh, all kinds of. Uh, but this is this over and above and beyond. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can continue. Uh, very, very quick.
how can how can you be sure that <coughs> that that the AI can can simulate uh, human uh, reasoning? I, I mean, I've been uh, looking into some uh, paraconsistent logics where uh, where there are more than than these two yes. truth conditions, true and false, uh, both true and false, for instance. And one of the proponents of this kind of view uh, thinks that that this is how uh, uh, humans reason. Well, there's. Uh, I, I mean, the, the first thing is I'm uh, skeptical that we can. Uh, Build a logic that will uh, follow human reasoning. Yeah. Um, if I say that uh, I'm uh, optimistic, but I'm not sure yeah, that we'll be able to simulate the, the thinking process. I'm more thinking about uh, uh, artificial uh, neural networks uh, and uh, things like that, <coughs> yeah, uh, where uh, things like the reasoning and consciousness uh, they are uh, emergent uh, from uh, uh, exposure to the environment and learning. Uh, uh, through feedback, yeah, but uh, I don't think we can come up with logic that uh, is uh, describing all kinds of human reasoning. And this is one of the big advantages that we have uh, over AI so far. Yeah, uh, we're very flexible. In one moment, I can be a, a rigorous mathematician, and in another one, I can be at home with my children, and the logics are completely different uh, that are at work here. Yeah, and uh, I mean fuzzy uh, logics uh, and other. Uh, uh, there, there, there are many uh, things, and they, they have users, yeah? but uh, I don't think that any of them will are able to capture uh, the logic of interacting uh, with a my five year old. Tells child. me that it's very interesting to go on, and you can of course uh, you, uh, discuss more with Peter, and we should thank for the nice talk.